Okay, in this example, we have a vapor compression refrigeration cycle using ammonia as the working fluid. And we're told that it exits the evaporator at, as a saturated vapor at a particular temperature, enters the condenser at a particular pressure and temperature, and, uh, and, um, as a, and then exits as a saturated liquid at a particular pressure. There's no significant heat transfer between the compressor and its surroundings, and the refrigerant passes through the evaporator with a negligible change in pressure. If the refrigeration or refrigerating capacity is 150 kilowatts, determine a bunch of things. So let's go ahead and just sketch out a picture of what this cycle looks like. We have a condenser here that's transferring heat into the hot reservoir, so we'll call this removed. Leading into that, we have the compressor. So there's some power going in, so I'll call that W dot in. And we're going to call this state two. Leading into the compressor, uh, it comes from the evaporator. This is where we have the heat or the energy coming in from the cold reservoir. We'll call that Q dot added state one between the evaporator and the compressor. And then we also have a throttling valve. So let's include that in our diagram as well. So we're given some information here. So for state one, we're told um, that uh, ammonia exits the evaporator as a saturated vapor at minus 22 degrees C. So that's state one. So we're told it's saturated vapor. T1 is minus 22 degrees C. And we're told that it enters the condenser at a certain pressure and temperature. So let's make a note of that. So that's state two. And then we're told that it exits the condenser at, as a saturated liquid at a particular pressure, so that's state three. And uh, we're also told that the refrigeration capacity is 150 kilowatts, so that refers to the heat being added into the evaporator. Remember that down here, this is our cold reservoir. This is where we're trying to we're trying to remove heat from the cold reservoir or remove energy from the cold reservoir and that goes into the evaporator. So we're told that Q dot added, it's Q dot added, is 150 kilowatts. All right. Let's uh, let's also go ahead and sketch this on a TS diagram. We'll draw our vapor dome. So this remember our working fluid is ammonia. In this particular case, we're dealing with changes of phase in this whole uh, cycle. So state one, we're starting as a saturated vapor at minus 22 degrees C. So there's our T1, saturated vapor. So we're on the right-hand side of the vapor dome. State two, we're going to a much higher temperature. Oh, by the way, I should sketch in a, an isobar. So an isobar looks like this. So this is our P1. That P1 is our, um, well, that, that's, the, that's our first isobar. So state two is at a much higher temperature and pressure. So that'll be somewhere over here. In fact, if you, when we eventually look up the, the corresponding uh, phase for state two, you'll see it's a superheated vapor. So there we are in state two. And there's our pressure two. Then to go to state three, that's through the condenser, that's a constant pressure process. So we'll follow the isobar over to where it's a saturated liquid at state three. So that puts us there. And then from state three to state four, that is a constant enthalpy process through the through these uh, throttling valve. So state four will put us somewhere down here. The entropy will increase as we go through that expansion process through the throttling valve. So that gets us down to there. And then through the evaporator is a constant pressure process. So that, that 
um, moves us along that same P1 uh, isobar. So that's what it'll look like on our TS diagram. All right. Well, let's go ahead and figure out the mass flow rate of refrigerant. That's our part A here. That's going to come from um, applying the first law to the evaporator, where we know the rate at which heat is transferred. So what we need to do, actually, before we do that, is we have to find the specific enthalpies at all of these uh, particular locations, right? So we need to go to our tables. And if we go through that, I should have given myself more room. But if you go through the uh, tables for ammonia uh, for state 1, let me just mark that down, P1, the, the pressure corresponding to state 1, when you look that up for saturated vapor, that'll be 1.7390 bar. Specific enthalpies, 1415.08 kilojoules per kilogram. And specific entropy, 5.6457 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. You can do the same sort of thing for the other states. So for state two, we already were given the pressure and temperature. When you look up the specific enthalpy, what you'll find there is that that's a superheated vapor. When you look up the specific enthalpy, that's going to be 1798.45 uh, kilojoules per kilogram. Specific entropy is 5.7475 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. State 3, the corresponding temperature for state 3, since we know it's a saturated liquid, that comes out to be 41.03 degrees Celsius. H3 is 376.46 kilojoules per kilogram. S3 1.3729 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. By the way, I'm getting these values from the back of your textbook. For state 4, we know H4 is equal to H3 because that's through the throttling valve. It's a constant enthalpy process, so that's also 376.46 kilojoules per kilogram. And we know P4 is equal to P1, which was the 1.7390 bar because it's on the same isobar. So this part is just, you know, this part right here is just looking up values from the property tables for ammonia. And again, I use the back of the textbook. So to get the mass flow rate, we'll apply first law to the evaporator. So you draw a control volume around the evaporator and apply the first law. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show that here, but here's what you end up getting. So that'll be what you end up uh, determining from the first law. We know now uh, from, uh, from the properties, we know the value for H1, we know the value for H4, we know the Q dot added, so we can solve for the M dot. So when you plug in those numbers, it comes out to be 0.144 kilograms per second. Okay, so that's an application of the first law. Let's go back up and look at part B. Uh, determine the power input into the compressor. So that again is another application of the first law for control volume surrounding the compressor. So apply first law to the compressor and you'll get the power in. When you simplify the first law, that'll be um, m dot times h2 minus h1. Again, we know the values for the specific enthalpies. We now know the value for the mass flow rate. When you work this out, it comes out to be 55.4 kilowatts. All right, let's move on to the next question. Determine the coefficient of performance for this refrigeration cycle. So the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle is defined as being the, what we're interested in is, um, we're trying to get as much um, heat from the cold reservoir into the evaporator for as little power into the whole cycle. So we're trying to get as much Q dot added for as little power in. And we just evaluate, we were given the Q dot added, we just evaluated the W dot in, so when you plug in those numbers, this comes out to be 2.71. 
Then the last thing we're asked to find is the isentropic compressor efficiency. Okay, so the compressor efficiency. So if you recall the isentropic compressor efficiency, that's given by the work that we have to put in to the compressor if it's isentropic divided by the actual work that we have to put in, which if you work out the first law for these, um, in the numerator, that'll just be our H, this will be H2S minus H1, where the 2S refers to if the uh, process was isentropic. The denominator, we already worked out, that was just H2 minus H1, which uh, we know the values for that. So the only thing that we don't know in that equation is the H2S. Right? So again, just graphically, what we're talking about here is if we went from 1 to 2S, 2S would be right there. It, it, that would be an isentropic case, so S1 and S2S would be the same. Same, we're going between the same pressures. So we know then for H2S, we know that state 2S, P2S is equal to P2, which was 16 bar absolute. And we know S2S is equal to S1, which is 5.6457 kilojoules per kilogram, Kelvin. We can go to the property tables and look up the corresponding temperature and specific enthalpy. You'll find that those are in the superheated vapor region. So T2S, when you, you have to do some interpolation, but that comes out to be 143 degrees C. And H2S comes out to be 1755.38 kilojoules per kilogram. So when you plug that back into the isentropic compressor efficiency formula, that we just derived, it comes out to be about 89%. It's 88.8%. So relatively high efficiency compressor. All right, that is the end of this example. We've answered everything that they've asked for. Once again, most of this is review. You've, or pretty much all of it's review. You've done these sorts of things in previous problems. You know, it comes down to drawing a sketch of the process as well as on a TS diagram just to kind of help visualize things. A lot of effort goes into finding properties at the various states that is using property tables or perhaps uh, models like incompressible substance model or ideal gas model. Here we just use property tables. And then it's a matter of applying the first law, knowing how to define the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle, knowing how to define the isentropic compressor efficiency, then going ahead here, this part is the first law again, and then this is a table property lookup. All right, that concludes this example.